Alright. <laughs> Hello friends, uh, I'm Johan and I'm going to talk about digital rights uh, for the marginalized. Um, and this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I guess God is constantly opening up my eyes to see how um, my like personal privilege has allowed me to like really um, like pursue digital rights while some other people who might not be as um, like technically inclined or even as wealthy or not know about these things don't have that same privilege of having the ability to pursue digital rights when they're necessary. Um, so one thing that uh, I want to address is like uh, is tech less important or like digital uh, rights less important than other rights um, like food security um, for example. Well the thing is that like the, these are all it's it's not, not um, it's a slippery slope to say that every that it's one issue that's greater than another um, because first of all God cares about all of them uh, and second of all they all influence each other so for the example of food security um, every company nowadays is a tech company um, and even if it's not like explicitly tech I mean they use technology um, grocery stores use technology planning for um, cities uses technology. Um, and it's just so the ways, like the ways that I think are all influenced, like they might have an optimization tool. How can we place these grocery stores so that they're the most optimal? And then that might have something that excludes um, minorities or poorer areas because they don't aren't viewed as as valuable um, as other people. So that's I'll talk about more about the inherent bias of some technology later. Um, another thing is that. Um, the aspect of digital rights is that it goes to, um, as it relates to freedom of speech and other basic rights. Um, those, I would argue, um, like, are the basis for other rights. If you have freedom of speech, you can debate things and you can um, push for other other rights. Uh, in the same way, I'll get to some of those later. But um, privacy uh, allows people to be better at activism uh, and whistleblowing. And there's a lot more to that. So another more obvious thing is that the marginalized are often ignored when designing technology, uh, like a grocery store example, or just um, you think about like a large company. There are people who are going to be their customers. They're targeting people who have money, uh, just inherently because they're trying to make money. So that's another thing to think about. So what are digital rights? You can think about all the positive things on the internet, or like what you think the internet should be. It should be a place where knowledge is more open, um, people can connect with each other, get freedom of speech, um, freedom, the right to privacy, uh, equal access, and like just the, the freedom of information that kind of people really see value in in the web. Um, so, uh, the first thing I'm talking about is the bias in some of these systems. So there's um, companies like Google um, and like Amazon and a lot of these like um, well, I guess not as much Amazon, but like free, but you have ads type thing. Their, their main business is advertisement, and the way they do that is by um, building up a profile of their customers and figuring out what ads should I um, target to that individual. And the thing is that these profiles tend to pick up bias um, from uh, like the people that design them and the data that they're fed and the ways that they interact with the people using the services. Um, there's a study by Carnegie Mellon that said that um, the, they did a, a test. They made fake accounts um, with like, or they basically bots that would go visit different websites to build up a profile of like, this is a um, female job seeker and a male job seeker. And then they looked at the ads that they were served. And they found that the male job seekers were more likely to be served higher paying jobs than the female, all other things being equal. Um, which they um, like reported that to Google. Um, so they're measuring the Google ad targeting system, um, and there was some effort to fix it. But just based on the way the system is designed, it is impossible to remove all the bias, and it's still already going to be bias from, or still going to be bias in this. Another thing is background checks. So another use of these, um, what are called shadow profiles, or um, like a portfolio of all the information that a um, company will collect is that some companies their only job is to use these profiles and then someone will pay them to use um, to do a background check on someone 
and the um, there's been some research on bias in that as well, um, where it'll be less likely to approve someone who's a minority. Um, and a uh, verse that relates to this in the Bible is that uh, if you see, or Ecclesiastes 5.8, if you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. The high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over it. And this just uh, really spoke to me because this, this system is so complex. Like, even I have been trying to like, learn about these things. I don't quite understand how, how all of it works and like everything that's going on in the background. Um, and like the fact that one uh, like decision like, oh, we're going to use um, the uh, Google ad targeting for our web page uh, seems harmless, but it's playing into the bias basically. And it's not like, oh, you're a bad person for choosing that system. It's like, this, it's more complicated than that. It's all these layers and it's all these authorities that, um, or there's like companies that rely on other companies. And just the whole flow of data through the system is very complicated. And it's hard to um, grab your mind around. Uh, another big thing is government surveillance, uh, as opposed to like the um, private sector with companies and all that. Uh, the Snowden revelations revealed something called the Prism Program, where all these large corporations were sharing data with the government, but they had a um, like a non-disclosure thing where they couldn't tell that they were sharing that information. And the whole point of this was to build up a pattern of life, a like sort of profile again about different people and to figure out is there an anomaly? Is this person acting strangely? And they also had access to all this information that they could go in manually, uh, like an actual person going in and reviewing the data. Um, and the rule was that they could monitor people three hops away from a suspected terrorist or a suspected criminal, which if you have 190 Facebook friends or any social media, that's five million people three hops away. Everyone had 190 friends. So it's basically an invasion of privacy for at least those people the three hops away, if not the two, and so on. So um, the effectiveness of this program, they said it, pre it prevented 54 terrorist attacks, but later, um, after challenged by being challenged by this um, study that they that ProPublica did, the uh, uh, director of the NSA later admitted that it only prevented one uh, plot for sure. Um, the Patriot Act is what sort of uh, enabled some of this, although it was going on before. And it was passed weeks after 9-11, uh, when people were fairly in fear of terrorism, um, which isn't, that's a whole other topic, but um, that was, there was a lot of, um, I guess, manipulation of the public of like, using terrorism as a excuse to make these widely over um, broad surveillance programs, which should have been a little more targeted um, and less uh, like more transparent at least telling people what the program is like because they, it took the Snowden revelations for them to find that out. Um, then the Freedom Act in 2015 dialed some of it back. Uh, now the phone companies have to, or they retain the data and the government has to go through the phone company and request a specific one. But it's still, we have a very big lack of transparency there. Uh, and we don't know quite um, some, how some of the other types of programs are like, are they still as um, bad as it used to be. Um, so now switching gears to just um, personally um, and for each of us, the cost of living and the um, uh, things that we take for granted. Um, so internet access is like something we don't even think about. Like what if you had, didn't have internet access and you needed to find a job? It would be a lot harder. You'd have to like actually go like, around looking for a job or find someone who did, did have internet access to help you out, like you'd be reliant on other people uh, a lot more. Um, but the thing is that, um, personally, I used to have this mindset where if like a homeless person had a smartphone or something, I'd think like, why do they have a smartphone? Couldn't they have just bought like food or like something else that they was more necessary? Um, and I realized that that's completely wrong. Like, I take, I, take it for granted myself that I'll have access to these things, but then I like judge other people for when they do. Uh, and that's really, um, like, I don't know, that's just really hypocritical, I guess. It's like Matthew 7.3, uh, uh, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Um, it kind of gives new meaning to that verse for me. 
Um, and another thing about the cost of living, if you need, um, let's say, um, online privacy, which is something you don't need until you it's too late, you realize, oh, I let's go up with a scenario of like, I'm going to work at this company, and there's this um, like bad practice going on that I need to uh, anonymous, anonymously submit or whatever, or like find some way to be a whistleblower. There's just a lot of layers of things that are like in the way of that. Um, and if you don't have like a lot of free time, or like if you're like if you're like actually struggling and you need this job and you don't want to lose your job, like it's a really hard decision. Do I like do the right thing or do I and lose my job or do I keep my job? Something like that. Um, it's like you don't you don't need it until you, you know you need it. Um, but so basically, I've had personally um, been pursuing these things, finding different options, um, and I don't know. It's opened my eyes to see like I don't know a lot of the steps required to achieve uh, digital rights, or like for someone to be a little more um, like I guess um, like private or um, have more freedom of speech or all these things. The steps required are not easy for everyone. Um, and it's important to acknowledge my uh, privilege and also just our privilege in general of having like money or whatever I could um, like even have access to the internet in the first place. There's a lot of assumptions that we're making at every level. It's like I have internet access, if I needed to um, like contact, contact someone securely, I could find a way, and like all these different things. Um, so over there I have some stories that um, relate to how this personally affected people. Um, there's a professor who was falsely arrested based on surveillance of his emails that um, he, they thought he was like spying for China uh, and it was like a really bad outcome. Like, he was like discredited as a professor. And then they found out, oops, we made a mistake and it was still the damage was done. It was like, took a while. Um, he lost a few months of his life to <laughs> Like trying to sort that out, um, and it was just like, yeah. Well, you can read more about it over there. Um, and there's also one about facial recognition in Florida, uh, Florida's law enforcement, um, also picking up on some of the bias in those systems. So, you got any questions? <laughs>